day. Uh, it's okay. It's okay if you weren't here that day, no problem. And this is the first of three in a little series that we're offering this spring. So uh, three different kind of focus areas, but similar themes. What can we do when we're engaging with our students to teach equitable, inclusive, um, engaging classes that help our students learn and thrive? So I do hope that you can join me for the other two sessions as well, April 5th and April 22nd, I think, all starting at noon central. Uh, with that, let me jump in. And again, I anticipate that maybe some of you were here in January with me and maybe some of you weren't, and that's okay. I have a question for those of you who were here, and that is, what do you remember? So during today's session, I will ask you to participate with me in the chat box at various times throughout the talk. And then we are going to pause for questions about halfway through, and we'll have time at the end for questions and conversation as well. So if you were here in January, what is one thing that stands out? What do you remember? And I will explain why I have structured this activity right off the bat um, after we get a few responses in. When it is those designated times for questions, if people would like to unmute, we can do that. We can um, maybe raise a Zoom hand, but uh, otherwise during the presentation, I'll ask you to please just participate in the chat box just for logistical reasons. So, this is like a quiz. <laughs> if you were here in January, what do you remember? Yes, okay, I talked about, thank you, Terrence, about interacting um, with students in the discussion. I actually wanna go into a little more depth on that topic today. There is a school of thought in online teaching uh, circles that we should not be participating in the discussions. I am not in that school of thought. I believe that um, you wouldn't start a discussion in a physical classroom and then walk out of the room and expect your students to stay on topic. So I believe that we can stay in our online discussions and facilitate the conversation and guide the learning just like we do when we're leading a discussion in person. And yes, uh, I did talk about a very simple technology and Terrence, I see your question. Do you wanna expand? No, I'm just kind of thinking, why would an instructor not want to be involved right. in the discussion? That, I just, yes, it that. Baffles, it baffles me because I teach courses that are very technical. And, you know, part of that is understanding how the technology works. And if I'm asking a question to, to kind of teach them something, I want them to kind of see in their, you know, when I answer their question to also kind of give them a little, a little push toward how that's going to work, how that's right. going to be beneficial to them. Right. Thank you for clarifying. I, when I saw why I thought um, you were questioning why we would want to be in the discussion, but you're going the other way. <laughs> and there no, is, I, uh, just, I just think the discussion is such a great opportunity for the faculty to do the conversation, exactly. ask additional questions and to, to kind of get a feel for the room that why a faculty member would would do a discussion question and then never and then not participate in it is just beyond me right and so i'll i'll just comment briefly and then we're going to press forward a little bit and michelle i see your question would you be willing to give me um wait until we have our first break in order to address that question it's a really good one and i have lots of thoughts but i don't have a slide for them so let me um let me address that when we come to our first break but just to address terence uh your valid and i would agree with you question about why in the world would you not be in the discussion two things happen number one there there are people who argue that faculty voices can dominate the student conversations and that is true we can overpost and kind of squelch uh, contributions from our students. But then I also actually come back to my sense that we just haven't really been prepared to teach online effectively. And so I think a lot of faculty don't engage in the online discussions because nobody suggested to them that they should. So, and they just haven't made that connection about how we do in fact guide learning just like we do in person. They just haven't sort of made that connection if that makes sense. So, but I am, firmly in the camp that we do need to be in there guiding and facilitating, asking questions, praising contributions, pushing for a little bit more without dominating. There's, there's a balance there. So um, yeah, okay, so some good conversation in the chat. And again, let me just clarify the way that I tend to use this chat box. 
I will invite you all to engage with me in the chat box at various times with, with particular questions. But when I'm not asking you those things, I'm not, I'm not gonna be watching the chat because one of the re recommendations that I make is that we need to maintain really strong eye contact. And as you know, it's really hard to present and talk and read the chat all at the same time. So I'm very intentional about when I will look at the chat box, but meanwhile, I encourage you all to feel free to collaborate and share ideas there as well. And maybe Kathy, Susan, uh, maybe you can just keep an eye on any of those questions. We'll come to Michelle's later, but if any questions come in that you wanna um, bring up during those times, let's do that. But uh, yeah, please do feel free to share your thoughts and ideas. So a couple of things. First of all, I start with this question because it is a collaborative retrieval practice opportunity. And this is something that I would highly recommend that you think about whether and how you can do in your classes. Essentially, if you were my students and we had met last week, let's just say, I could open the class session by saying, what do you remember from what we talked about? And this can be certainly individual. Everybody submit you know, a short response or um, there's lots of ways that you could do that in person or online. But essentially asking people to remember what they learned and especially to generate the information, not to pick from a multiple choice question as an example, but to articulate for themselves what they learned deeply um, rooted in learning science that is really gonna help people retain that information. Now, the other thing that I knew, I thought it was very likely that people here today might not have been here in January. And so doing a collaborative retrieval practice kind of maybe catches some other people up to speed who weren't here that day. So this is a, a technique, again, if you are teaching synchronous, open your Zoom class with this, open your in-person class with this, um, make it a, the first discussion post or the first discussion forum in Canvas for each module. What did we do in the last module? Just getting a way to um, invite folks to kind of dredge up for themselves. And then again, it, you can either do it class-wide or individually, small groups, lots of ways to structure that as well. So I have a spoiler alert. I'm going to give my top tip for teaching online during this pandemic, because I, I hope, I believe we're approaching the end of it, but it, I don't believe we're all the way out yet. And I do believe that the way we teach and interact with students has changed for the better and for good. So I have a top tip that I'm going to share with you. And if you don't remember anything else from this time together, I hope you take away this. And that is that I would recommend that you do more in Canvas. And I want to clarify this. I don't mean that we just sort of uh, willy-nilly add all kinds of busy work and it just add all kinds of activities in Canvas. I'm not saying that. I am saying that as we move forward, even if we are teaching in person, adding well-structured and purposeful learning activities in Canvas is a really great way to teach more equitable and inclusive classes. And my next topic when I'm back on April 5th will be with a focus on equity and inclusion. And I will have lots of ideas to share about what we can structure in our classes that um, allow students to do this work. So um, Canvas actually has a lot of features and tools and functions that, are, that we can apply learning science and use things like discussion forums to get students learning from and with each other. Uh, lots of tools that we can use. And so, especially if you weren't familiar, the research shows that many, many faculty didn't really use all the functions of Canvas as an example. Uh, but I believe the pandemic has changed that. We can now uh, see what is possible. So I'm going to encourage us to explore the technology. I have some ideas for you today, and I'll have more ideas when I'm back in April for two different sessions. So, um, yeah, okay, so let's look at where we're going today. I am going to touch base. Now, we talked about this in January, but in case you weren't here, a quick review of the guiding frameworks that shape my work. Lots of ideas for how we can um, engage our students very, very practically speaking and time for questions. Now, again, as I mentioned, we will pause about halfway through the strategies and just check in and, and we'll take Michelle's question first and then proceed from there and see what other questions people have at that time. So I think it's really important to think a little bit about the unique challenges of online teaching and learning. And um, for me, it's, it's good to recognize the challenges that we have in order to identify effective solutions to overcome those challenges. So I, I invite us to think about what we know about online classes. And this goes back to what I was saying just a few minutes ago that I believe in general, faculty members have not really been invited or prepared in a way 
for teaching online. And I would also argue this is not what we set out to do. Most of us who are teaching online today didn't have visions of being amazing online teachers when we pursued graduate school and uh, sought a career in higher education, but it is the reality that we have now. And so uh, thinking about uh, what we know, what we don't know about online teaching can help us be more effective. So um, this slide is just intended to draw the contrast between what we know about online versus in person. We have all had far more experience being students and educators in a physical classroom. We know what it looks like. If we walked into our classroom and it looked like this, that would be weird and wrong because that's not how a classroom looks. But I would argue that we don't have that same level of experience and we don't even know the norms and the expectations as John was kind of mentioning there in the chat a few minutes ago is that we just don't have some of that experience yet. Now we're getting it, the pandemic has accelerated this and students are going to want increased online offerings. So it, it, it behooves us to uh, become more familiar, but recognizing that sometimes we just are still learning about what good online teaching and learning looks like is important. Now we do know a lot about online classes. We, here's a representative student and a representative faculty member. We know from the research that students struggle to stay engaged online, that uh, attrition rates are higher, that it requires more independence and autonomy on the part of the students and that they struggle to be motivated. It's easy for them to drift away. From the faculty perspective, we know that faculty struggle to keep students engaged. And I would argue that in both cases, we have a hard time seeing the other people across the screen as real people. So it, it, it's very easy, even when we're in Zoom, we're kind of this two-dimensional being here. We are not fully embodied and it's very different than when we are all together in the room. But we know that there is abundant research on how we can help students stay motivated. And a big part of that is to foster the connections person to person. And you know, even before we started today, there was some chit chat back and forth. Um, how are you? Um, I felt terrible hearing about your experience, Gail, with the tornadoes. I hope you're okay. But right, those little kinds of connections really are important and that is going to help students uh, engage. And again, just to touch, this is the topic of our January session. There might be a recording available, so I would encourage you um, to go back and look for that. But yeah, it's just really important to connect with people and um, foster these things in online environments. But I think the big question is how? How do we do this? It, it can feel stilted. Um, so we're gonna work today looking at three different guiding frameworks. Again, I, I did do this on January 5th, but I'm gonna do it very quickly again here because it's really important. And that is to start with the community of inquiry framework. This came out of research in the late 1990s where the, the team of researchers wanted to understand what goes into a really good online class. They identified three presences that you see depicted here in the center. The cognitive presence is the thought work that you and your students engage in. The teaching presence and the social presence, I would argue, is where we're still trying to figure it out. How do we interact with the people in our classes on a purely social level the same way that we would when we're in person? We would greet students in the hallway or ask them how their day is going. You know, that's really easy to do in person. These things don't happen quite as naturally online, but very important. And just as we were talking about with online discussions a few minutes ago, how do we guide and facilitate the learning of the people in our classes in online environments? So in 2012, another couple of researchers came along and proposed that we needed a fourth presence, the emotional presence addresses this idea that we do bring our emotions into our online classes, so do our students. We are dealing with a lot of emotions right now still. We, we are um, fatigued, we are uh, feeling isolated sometimes. Other days we have a lot of joy in our online interactions with our students and these shape and influence the way that we interact. And emotions are really, really powerful. We can put them to work and use them to help our students stay engaged and motivated. More on that in a few minutes. So the Community of Inquiry Framework helps us to recognize uh, what goes into effective online classes. We also need to think a little bit about universal design for learning. And each of these could be a whole presentation in and of themselves. So just really briefly, UDL is about um, how we provide options and supports for our students. So no matter what their unique needs or preferences are, they can be successful. It comes out of the built environment, the physical world. 
where we see, for example, a ramp going up next to a set of stairs. The ramp was put there for people using a wheelchair to get to where they need to go, but that ramp also benefits lots of other people, parents with a stroller or um, lots of, you know, folks um, with a rolly suitcase. Lots of people benefit from that ramp, even though it wasn't put there for them. And that's what UDL does, is it invites us to provide options that are built into the structure of the class and that benefit lots of uh, students, whether or not they need those options. Classic example, if we use videos in our online teaching, we should caption those recorded videos that helps people with a hearing impairment. But we also know that a lot of people just like to turn on the captions. It helps them process the information in other ways. So UDL is about providing options uh, and choices for students. And then we will be looking a little bit today at culturally responsive online pedagogy. We'll come back to this on April 5th when we're looking at strategies for equity and inclusion. How can we recognize that we bring our cultural values into our classes? We don't check those at the door. And likewise, our students are shaped by their home backgrounds, their community values, and they bring a lot of cultural wealth into our interactions. So if we're going to be inclusive, we want to think about how, recognize, how we can recognize and celebrate uh, the strengths of our students from diverse backgrounds as well. So with that, we're going to jump right into a series of practical strategies because I know it's good to have the theoretical frameworks, but what do we do? So we're going to think about some ways to help our students be successful in online classes. Now, the first thing that I want to talk about is something I mentioned a couple of slides back about students needing more independence and autonomy in order to be successful. We know that greater executive functioning skills are required so that students can organize their time, motivate themselves, keep themselves on track, monitor their progress, adjust their strategies if needed. All of these things are really great life skills. And my students are still developing some of those skills. And online classes do kind of require more of that ability to regulate their own learning. But can we do anything about that? Well, yes, we can. We can do some things in our online classes that help students develop what I would say are great life skills and that help them know where they're going. Because when we know the destination, when we see the purpose of what we're doing, we are naturally more engaged and more motivated to be successful. So the first thing I wanna talk about is a concept called backward design. Now, this is a, a term from the instructional design world. And what it refers to is having a destination in mind for your classes. I like to think about this in terms of a road trip analogy. And I suspect this is gonna resonate with you even if you hadn't heard this terminology before. Really, it's just about intentional planning of your classes. And I think we all do that. The concept of surfacing the design of the class is to help your students see it and see the value and the purpose of where they're going because that's going to help them stay engaged and stay persistent. So backward design asks us to think about where we want students to end up at the end of our class, at the end of the semester or the session, what do they need to know and be able to do? That's your course learning objectives, right? Those are the course learning outcomes where students need to be able to do those things if they've successfully completed the class. And that's listed on your syllabus. For me, I think about that as the destination of a road trip. Most of us, if we're planning a road trip, most of us determine ahead of time where we want to end up. <laughs> Maybe a few free spirits just get in and start driving, but most of us have a destination in mind. And this is the same idea. We know where we want our students to end up. Those are the course learning objectives. Now, we also then take a step back from that and say, how are we going to know if students met those objectives, those course level, the ones that are on the syllabus? How are we going to know that? Well, that would be our final assessment, final project, final exam, final whatever it might be. The cumulative assessment that we have in our classes is designed to tell us whether students got to where we wanted them to go. And again, I equate this to us looking for progress, both when we arrive and even along the way on a road trip. So I live quite near the Grand Canyon in Arizona, and I will tell you that if you arrive at the Grand Canyon, you're going to know it. There's really big signs, there's kiosks, there's a lot of traffic you're gonna know that you've arrived at the Grand Canyon. And so we think about that in terms of that final project. What are we asking students to do to show us that they got there? But it's not just about the final destination, it's also about making good progress along the way. 
So your uh, smaller assessments in your class, whether those be assignments or group projects or quizzes or uh, whatever it might be, even discussion forums, I use those as markers of students making progress in the right direction. Those are like that little blue dot that we rely on in Google Maps now to help us make sure that we are going in the right direction and making good progress. So we think about the smaller assessments in our class aligning with that final project so that students are showing us that they are learning what they need in order to be successful on the final. And then the last thing that we think about with backward design is to plan for the journey. What will students need in our classes in order to be successful in our assessments? We think about the textbook that we choose or videos that we select or other readings. It's the instructional materials. And I would also argue the activities, practice um, activities, things like this. Again, discussion forums in online classes help students to be successful on the journey to that destination. Now, on a road trip, we might think about what we need for the drive. Maybe we have snacks, water, maybe some an, an audio book or some podcasts. And then we also think about what we need when we get to the destination, whether it's the beach and we have our umbrella and our sandcastle kit, or whether it is the Grand Canyon and we have our hiking boots and our trekking poles, we think about what we need and the same thing, what do our students need to be successful? Now, backward design can feel very linear, but I like this graphic because it kind of reminds me that sometimes the process doesn't feel super checkbox, you know, real linear, but these are the things that we want to consider. Where do we want our students to go? How are we know if they get there and if they are getting there and what do they need to be successful? Now, this, again, it's just intentional design and planning of our class, but in an online class, students sometimes don't see where they're going. It can be really overwhelming. And you might say, well, they should read the syllabus. And I agree, they should, but <laughs> what else can we do to help our students see where it is they're going? Because when they see that, they'll be more motivated to stay engaged. So two recommendations. One thing to consider is whether you can give them something to do in the first week of class that is going to start preparing them to be successful on that final assessment. Now, this can take lots of different forms. If you have a final project or a research paper or something like that, you can get students thinking about the topic that they want to investigate right in week one. And I would say more than think about those ideas, get them to submit their ideas, get them to do something, get them to go out and find one source that they think they might use. Because again, it's really easy, given the level of independence that students need, it's easy for them not to kind of see and not plan effectively. If you teach something more clinical or procedural, maybe students can start practicing step one in the first week, or if maybe they can do the first step in solving an equation in week one. It's just a matter of getting students hands on with that uh, big project at the end or that big exam, whatever it might be, get them practicing and doing in the first week and tell them, tell them why you're asking them to do those things so that they see where they're going and they're gonna be successful at the end when they get there. And then one other recommendation in terms of helping students see the purpose of what we're asking them to do is to get them to actually engage with those learning objectives or uh, course learning outcomes, whatever term you prefer, is you know we know that those are in the syllabus. We also know that oftentimes our students don't really focus on those. In fact, I am teaching an online class right now and it, well, not right now, because I'm here with you, but I have an online asynchronous class that's going on right now. And if you were to ask me, and you can feel free to do so, what are my course learning objectives? I would not be able to just immediately tell you them. I, I think we know that they're there, but we don't engage with them actively, necessarily. And if we don't do that so much, our students certainly don't. But those objectives are like the goals. You know, by the end of this class, or even by the end of this module, you should be able to do X, Y, and Z, and as I've been saying, when we know why we're being asked to do something, we are more invested in that thing. So in week one, for example, or you could do this in each module, ask students to respond to the learning objectives. I've done this a few different ways. I have sometimes asked students to write or record a couple of sentences about each learning objective. Other times I've asked them two questions. Which one are you most excited about? and Which one are you most worried about? It's just a way to get students really kind of immersed in their own learning and thinking about what they should be able to do in order to help them see the value. 
So again, thinking about that, um, that intentional plan for the class and helping students see that, lots of other ways to do that, but that's just a couple of ideas that we can uh, start with. Now I'm gonna turn our attention to the value of designing for emotion. And if you were here in January, I did talk about this a little bit because it's my favorite topic in the world. It is so powerful. There is so much potential with engaging emotion. And again, think about that emotional presence. It was depicted as encircling the whole Venn diagram because some colleagues and I have um, envisioned this as so impactful and so pervasive that it really does affect everything that happens in online teaching and learning, actually in person as well. But in online environments, I would argue we need all the help that we can get. So designing for emotion, we have to recognize that emotion and cognition are inextricably linked. In other words, you cannot separate emotions from thought processes. And this is different than what we tend to think of in academia. The pursuit of knowledge should be cold and rational and logical. But it's not. Neuroscience shows that we cannot think without emoting. And as I've mentioned, they are very powerful. Emotions grab our attention. They help us stay focused. They motivate productive learning behaviors. And they help us remember information better and longer term. So why would we not bring emotional connections and um, emotionally evocative activities into our classes? When I think about designing for emotion, I have two main categories in mind. First is the way that we present information. So I chose not to include this picture because I, I suspect it could be triggering for some people, but I will invite you to think about the current situation in the Ukraine right now and think about some images that you have seen that have really strengthened the impact of what's going on over there. And the media and advertisers do this all the time. You, it's one thing to read about something. It's another thing to see an image or watch a video or sometimes even a song brings up, um, again, advertisers do this a lot, um, to really help students connect with what they're learning. So the way we present information can grab the attention and keep us engaged. Uh, this is why Shakespeare teachers always show movies of Shakespeare's plays because it really brings it to life. It makes it more real. Students understand it more effectively. I have a friend who teaches literature in asynchronous online classes. He provides audio recordings of the poets narrating their poems because their performance brings out the emotion and deepens the meaning and helps students understand. So the, thinking about the way that we present information in Canvas, is there an image? Is there a video? Is there a TED talk? Is there some way to present information such that we bring things to life and enhance students' understanding of them in those ways? Now, for me, the other category in designing for emotion is what we're asking students to do. What are the activities that we're asking them to do? Anything that creates that emotional connection makes things more relevant or relatable to our students. Again, it's going to capture their emotional connections. So I have a friend who teaches pop culture in literature and film. She has a discussion forum where she asks students to talk about their favorite superpower. What is one superpower that they would choose? Well, um, you know, students love talking about those superpowers. They, it's not hard to get them to post. That's because it's fun, it's interesting. And then what she does as she facilitates the online discussion, she draws out class themes, good versus evil, character development, these kinds of things. So what can we ask our students to do to, uh, again, make something more fun, more interesting, more relevant? Um, and I know a biology professor who asks his students to go to the local store, take a sample from the handle of the shopping cart, analyze that sample for the microbes that are in there. I mean, gross, but also fascinating and disgusting and students do it. It's really interesting to them. So thinking about activities that they can apply their learning but also in ways that are relevant and just plain interesting. And so I'm gonna to turn to this uh, recommendation here next. And for this one, I'm gonna invite you to play a little trivia game with me. You may not have thought about this before, but we can think about emotions as, um, sorry, not emotions. We can think about curiosity and interest as knowledge emotions. These are things that get our attention and really keep us very, very engaged. 
if we are curious about something and, or if we find something really interesting, we will naturally be more tuned in. I think that makes sense at an intuitive level. Lots of research to back this up. So I have three questions that came out of research from 2017, to be fair, pre-pandemic. The questions are based on a study of faculty perceptions of online teaching, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. This is what I do. This is my discipline. The study had over 13,400 survey respondents teaching at two-year and four-year institutions, some teaching online, some not and uh, primarily in the United States, but uh, a smattering from some other countries as well. Three questions from this study. I'm gonna invite you just to guess the answer by putting a, a number in the chat box and we'll see how accurate you are. So the researchers asked faculty whether online education makes it more possible for more people to go to college and get a college degree or credential. What percentage do you think said, yeah, online education increases access? Put a number in the chat box if you're willing to play. No pressure if you don't want to, that's okay. 75, 85%, 70, 50, 90, 60, 30%, 50, 60, 85. We're all over the place, 35, 45, 75. Close, I haven't seen the actual answer. 79%, although it could have slipped past me. Oh, Art, you were just on it, very nice. 79% say, yeah, it makes it more possible. But how many of those 13,400 people think that it doesn't work, that students don't learn as well in online classes? What do you think? 75%, okay, 20%, all right, 60, 80, 60, 25, 80, we are all over the map again, 78, 30, 50, 95, 75, some skeptics here, 20%. The real answer is almost half. Now, again, this actually really motivates my work because this is what I do. I help us to teach more effectively. Research shows learning outcomes can be just as effective when we do this well, and that's what we're learning how to do. Last question in my trivia game. Thank you for playing. What percentage of the faculty respondents prefer to teach online? They prefer it to teaching in person. What percentage? 100%. Okay, 20%. Good. Quite a range. 20, 25. 10, 65, 30, 50, 90, 5%, 40, 50. The answer is 9%. 9% pre-pandemic. I'm curious how that question would be answered now. But um, yeah, that, again, that's really motivating to me because I believe we can learn to teach, uh, love teaching online. And we just maybe haven't been invited to do that quite yet. But that's why we're here today. So we can figure out what else we can do for our students. Now, let me unpack this activity. It is based on a well-known phenomenon in the research that says when we predict something, again, we are naturally more engaged. I know in finding out the answer, right? I know that when you put your number in, you were on the edge of your seat. You could hardly wait to find out what the real answer was. Okay, I'm being a little silly, but this really does work. Uh, this is why, um, yeah, like for example, a football pool, if you, if you uh, predict the winner of the Super Bowl, you're gonna watch the entire football season more closely. So what can we do in our classes to get students curious, to get them predicting, ask them questions instead of just give them the information all the time? This could be discussion forums. This could be, um, you know, as we're reading this novel, what do you think is going to happen next to that character based on the decision that she just made? Anything that we can do to get students wondering, curious, guessing, predicting um, is going to get them more naturally engaged and help them stay focused. Now, one more recommendation on the topic of designing for emotion, and then after this one, we are going to pause and see what's on your mind. We'll start with Michelle's question and then go from there for just a few minutes before we jump back into the slides. There is fascinating research that says that we can only think, prepare for your mind to be blown. Here we go. We can only think about what we care about. We can only think about things we care about. And you can, you can relate to this. We can only think deeply. So maybe you're on a committee and maybe the work of that committee seems tedious. You don't really see the value of it. It's hard to really dive in deeply with that work. It could be that you don't care about that committee work very well. But the flip side of this is all we have to do is to help our students care about what they're learning and they will be more deeply engaged. So lots of ways to do this. We're gonna dwell on this point in the April 5th 
presentation on designing for equity, teaching classes for equity and inclusion. But a primary strategy here is to help students see how what they're learning is valuable to them, is relevant to them, relates to their daily experience or their long-term goals and everything in between, help them to see the impact of what they're learning, help them to see how it plays out in the real world. I uh, was talking last week with a faculty member who teaches college algebra, and in her class, it, she has a, um, a running theme in her algebra class called there's math in that too. And she asks her students to be looking at the other classes that they're taking and figure out where math plays a part in those things. And again, thinking about the price of gasoline or rent or mortgage or whatever, there's lots of ways that we can help students see what they're learning and how it relates to them and to their goals. Uh, help them care about their learning in terms of those emotionally evocative images I have a friend who teaches natural disasters, and um, when she shows those images of the results of the tornado, as an example, it helps students really dive in more deeply. So thinking about how we can get students to care about their learning, again, discussion forums, examples that we use, um, activities that we create for them, really going to bring their learning to life and help them stay engaged. With that, Let's take a break here and see what's on your mind. Now, I don't have Michelle's question in front of me. I'm wondering if possibly Kathy or Susan uh, kept that or else I can just scroll back up and find it again. Um, <laughs> and I brought down the slides because it's good to have a break from the slides sometimes. Hey, Ms. Darby, I don't mind uh, restating my question if you wish. Absolutely, thank you. Great. Uh, well, I'm really enjoying your presentation, by the way. Um, taking you. notes vigorously. I am one of those who wasn't planning to be online still, and I am, yeah. and um, it's just been a learning process. And so I think a lot of uh, what we, we think we're doing right or we don't know comes back to us in evaluations or other things where you're like, I didn't even think of that or how it was coming across. Anyways, one of the things I've run into, and I did see this last semester and getting a little bit more pushback this semester, is... Um, not wanting to be called on, right? Or being, um, having students are fearful or have uh, re reservations of cold calling, I guess, mm -hmm. um, which I would naturally do in an in-class uh, situation. And I don't feel like I ever get uh, pushback or uncomfortable uh, levels, but I'm finding that's the case here. And then along with that on a Zoom class, uh, keeping cameras on. So I have on one level, again, when the, when the pandemic started, we're pretty lax about that but felt students weren't there, or you just felt, first of all, as, as a speaker, you feel like you're in a black hole when you just have names or black screens pointing at you, which I'm sure you, you get all the time. And uh, so then I tried to kind of up it a little bit, including on my syllabus on the expectation. And then I got pushed back on that too. Like, wow, she's, you know, she or my, the, the TA, someone's always on me about my camera on gosh, I just had to go to the bathroom when in reality, they want to keep their camera off the whole time. So those were just two issues. I don't know if you've had other faculty run into those. I'd be, um, I would really welcome how to solve that. I'm still struggling with it. Absolutely. And I think for the interest of time, I'm going to just answer this one particular question right now or your two questions, and then we'll save more time at the end because this is kind of complex. Luckily, um, I am going to come back to one of the key things that we can do that's going to help with both of these challenges um, and that is to help our students feel that they are in a trusting environment. I'm going to talk more about that. But if they feel that they can trust us and each other, in general, engagement is going to increase. And that includes things like feeling prepared or ready to take an intellectual risk and answer if we call on them or feel more comfortable with keeping cameras on. If these are really complex challenges and again, things that we never imagined. I did not set out to teach black boxes with little names in them or sometimes iPad or iPhone, right? That's not what I set out to do and you didn't either, but it is a way to be inclusive to offer these different modalities. So a couple of thoughts, um, everything, this is, I'm just gonna speak really plainly here. I believe that everything is more challenging online and that if we were in a physical room here, our connection would be different. And we would have more of a, something called collective effervescence, which is a term out of sociology um, that talks about the connection that we have when we're together and we feel more relaxed and more willing to take those intellectual risks. So we have to be really intentional to help our students feel prepared to branch out and to be brave. I like one of the recommendations that I came across very early in the pandemic and 
This is an author whose name is escaping me. What is it? He wrote a book called Creating Wicked Students, Paul Hanstead. That's what it is. And he talks about a technique that he developed over time that he calls tepid calling. And it's not cold calling. It is a way to put students on notice that in just a moment, you might call on them to ask for a question. So I might say, okay, Michelle, Enrique, and Gail, in, in a minute, I'm going to ask one of you to answer my question. So tune in. And it just kind of gives students a little bit of a warning that if you were away from your desk for a minute, wait a minute, come back. Um, so I like that idea of tepid calling. And I'm going to talk more about um, fostering trust in general to create more of uh, comfort in the class in a few minutes. Regarding cameras on or cameras off, a couple of things here. Think about how much training we give preschoolers and toddlers and kindergartners when they very first go to class. There's a lot of training and orientation about what they should do, where they should be, how they interact with other people. Again, given the relative newness of Zoom teaching and learning, students don't know. They don't have the norms. And I believe that we would be well served to give a little bit of training and onboarding, or at least to set the norms for our class. Research that came out again at the very early pandemic in the summer 2020, uh, these guys asked students, why do you not have your cameras on? And one of the main findings was students were saying, because nobody else does. I don't want to be the only one. And so a recommendation that came out of that study was just to tell students that in this class, when we can, we try to keep our cameras on. Again, um, previewing next week's or next time's material on equity and inclusion, I don't believe that we should require cameras. I really don't. We know that students might be in situations that they don't want to disclose or be in living situations where they don't have the ability to really be quiet and focused. So for many reasons, even though it helps to have cameras on, I don't think we should require it. But I do think that we can set those norms, we can co-create those norms with students. What do you all think we should do? It helps you and your learning when we engage with each other. And my last recommendation on this before I come back to the slides is to structure class intentionally. So here's an example. I deliberately brought down my slides just now because we know that uh, staring at slides in Zoom actually increases eye strain even more than just being in Zoom. And so I like to structure my presentations such that there is a break from slides. And if I were teaching, if you all were my class, I would say, hey, when we have our discussion breaks, I would encourage you to turn on your cameras. Or if you're going to go into a you know, breakout room, turn on your camera, say hello to your you know, peers there, but maybe invite students that it's okay to have their cameras off when you're lecturing, right? It's just kind of be intentional about, again, expectations and sequencing. So again, big questions. Um, I'm going to leave it there for now, though, and um, hopefully that gave you a few thoughts, too. That was fantastic and more than I was expecting, and, and thank you so much. I appreciate Yay. it. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle. All right, and coming back in, I have a few more recommendations to share with you, and then we are going to uh, finish with some questions. Ooh, yes, and I see your comment there, Michelle, about not leaving students hanging. That is one of the ways that we foster that trust, which is on the next slide, so I'm going to say more about that in a minute. But one of the things that we're talking about even now is to structure effective collaboration. And this actually does go a long way to creating a trusting environment. So here's an example. Uh, given the work that I do, I get to literally talk with thousands of faculty members and students all the time. That's, that's what's cool about my job. <laughs> and again, in early 21, one of the students was telling me that in her Zoom class, every Friday they had discussion groups and it was the same small group that they had for the whole semester. And the instructor wasn't uh, necessarily facilitating or leading anything. It was that the whole class meeting on Friday was to meet with your small group in a breakout group and then go through and answer questions on a Google Doc. And that would be the activity. And she herself said, I did not plant these words. She said, it creates a trusting environment. And what we know from the research is that um, students, when they do trust each other and when they engage in meaningfully structured collaborative activities, it helps foster those all important connections. It helps to replace what happens so naturally when we're in person. So whether it is a regular discussion group, and again, I would say something with an activity and a deliverable so that students have something, you know, some accountability that they have to uh, create during their time together, whether it is well-facilitated and meaningful discussion forum questions, whether it is a group project or even collaborative quizzes are um, can be very, very effective where students can 
get together and wrestle with the right answers and you can have them each submit their own individual quizzes, but the opportunity to talk it through with each other can really deepen their learning and their ability to learn from each other. We know that sometimes students explain concepts to each other better than we do. We are experts. We may have forgotten what it what a novice needs to know in order to get something. And so um, from, you know, from grade school on up, students can experience the opportunity to learn better from each other or just in different ways, a different explanation. So I'm a big fan of structuring collaboration in our online classes. We need to do it intentionally and effectively. And again, that could be a whole other topic. So I'll leave it there for now. But um, thinking about ways, even a Padlet, I don't know if you know this tool, I love it. Padlet is a nice, uh, padlet.com, a nice visual way to create a more appealing discussion kind of situation can be asynchronous. It could be synchronous. P students can post GIFs and memes and videos and links and all kinds of much more interesting things than what they can do easily in Canvas. So the opportunity to share ideas, remember the retrieval practice that we did at the beginning, um, these are things that I would encourage us to intentionally structure the ways that students can connect with each other and learn from each other. Now, this next slide, I've been previewing it for a while here, so I'll go ahead and bring it up. And this is about fostering trust. Uh, we know that students come to us with a variety of prior educational experiences. It could be that they had opportunity gaps in their previous, uh, previous education. It could be that they had underfunded schools. It could be that they had a really mean third grade teacher. And many of our students come into us with a healthy sense of mistrust and even fear and anxiety. And again, I would say these things are exacerbated in online classes. Our connections are not as strong. And these kinds of lack of trust and fear and anxiety 100% inhibit students' abilities to engage and learn. So when we foster trust, we help them overcome that fear and that anxiety and we invite them to engage in a more relaxed, alert state of mind that will help them to uh, you know, process information and uh, use what they're learning to synthesize and to apply and to solve problems, these kinds of things. This is based on the work of Stephen Brookfield. And he argues that our students want to see two things. They want to be able to trust us and to do that. They want to know that we are competent and that we are beneficent that we know what we're doing, we know what we're talking about, and that our pedagogical decisions are in the student's best interest. We are not just randomly throwing a whole bunch of stuff at them. We are not going to surprise them with a gotcha assignment. We have been intentional, and I would argue that we're still developing our competence, myself included, in our online teaching methods. But students want to know that we're acting in their best interest and that we know what we're doing, and there's a reason for what we're doing. So anything that we can do to help our students see those things. I'm a big fan of really transparent messaging. Tell your students why you're asking them to do a thing, how it's going to help them, what your reasoning is. Um, help them to see that you are objective in the way that you grade, maybe because you use rubrics and give a clear criteria on what they're supposed to do. Foster that trusting environment where students don't feel like they are gonna be caught off guard. And uh, whether again, whether it's something like cold called or whether they're just placed into breakout groups and they have no idea who's in that group with them. Um, being intentional to establish social connections, relationships, build that trust to allow students to take that, those intellectual risks and ask the question or um, try to answer the question. Um, these are things, and again, this could be a whole nother topic. So I'll leave it there for now, but look for ways to demonstrate to your students through your pedagogical decisions, through your class policies, through your assignment instructions, through your responsiveness on email, that they can trust you, that you're acting in their best interest. And I have one last recommendation for you that is really kind of focused on, again, helping students develop the autonomy and the independence that will serve them well in online classes and in life. So this is a recommendation that I call a goals contract. It's the last one I'm gonna kind of share with you before we should have plenty of time for additional questions and your ideas too, your, you know, what's working for you. The goals contract, you know, one of the questions or the pushback that I sometimes get from faculty members is, um, you know, we want to help our students, but we can't do it for them. They need to do the work. They have to do the learning for themselves. And, you know, this is absolutely fair. Uh, sometimes people interpret 
recommendations to help our students as you know lowering our standards so to speak or or uh, you know inviting students to not necessarily do everything but for me students do need to take responsibility for their learning they do have agency and they need to understand that they're, it is their job, whether they uh, sink or swim, it has a lot to do with their willingness to take that responsibility for their own learning. This activity structures uh, this kind of learning experience right in the class. And that's another thing I'm a fan of is creating assignments that maybe don't necessarily relate directly to your content, but that help students with strategies that are gonna help them be successful. So here's one example. The goals contract is something that you might do in the first week of class. And it's very, very simple. Again, helping students to take responsibility and exercise their agency over their experience. First thing we do is to ask students to identify two goals for their learning. Ask them to identify one action that's going to help them achieve those goals. What is one thing they're going to do to help them be successful? Ask them to identify one challenge. What is something that could come up that might impede their progress? And finally, what is one strategy that they could use if that challenge comes up? Now you could do this goals contract in lots of different ways. This could be an open-ended quiz in Canvas. This could be a discussion post. This could be an individual assignment. This could be a small group uh, discussion forum or breakout group, anything you can make this more individual or more public, you know, with students kind of working together on these things up to you. But the goal here, get it, the goal here is to, <laughs> sorry. The, the goal here is to get students to recognize that challenges do come up, but they need to sort of take action when those things happen. So if I were a student in your class, I might um, say that my goals are to always turn in my assignments on time and to always get at least 80% on quizzes. The action, I have blocked off four different days of each week that I'm going to log into class and engage with materials and do the, you know, the classwork. The challenge. What if my laptop goes on the fritz? What if it ends up in the tech repair shop for a week? How am I gonna do my online class? My strategy, my aunt lives across town and she has told me that I can come over and use her computer or maybe there are computers on campus, you know, anything like this, alternatives. Because what we want to do is to get students to recognize that challenges are inevitable in life but it doesn't mean that it's game over. You know, many times our online students do get tripped up by, well, I would say students in general, get tripped up by valid and understandable life circumstances. But if we can help them to recognize that they can overcome those challenges, we are doing them a really great service, not only to help them persist in our classes, but again, in future attainment of goals and uh, their college degree and these kind of things. So it doesn't really matter if that particular challenge comes up. This is just an exercise to plant those seeds in students' minds that challenges do and will come up, but they can take action. They can overcome those strategies with how they choose, or those challenges with how they choose to respond. So um, yeah, something that you might wanna add in, you can consider adding into the beginning of class. Now with that, uh, yeah. Chromebooks are a challenge. I hear you, Terrence. Okay, with that, I'm actually going to uh, press pause on the slides again and wrap up my presentation by asking you what is one thing that really um, stands out to you. And if people would like to answer in Spanish, maybe the interpreter can help me uh, see what those responses are or hear what the responses are. And meanwhile, if you want to share that in the chat box or I'm gonna go ahead and once again, um, open it up for conversation, pull down the slides. It might be easiest to raise your Zoom hand just in terms of um, you know, controlling the flow of the conversation, so to speak. One takeaway from today in the chat box or raise your hand or your questions, your thoughts, your perspectives. We have about, um, what, 12, 13 minutes? for a little bit more conversation. And then the cool thing is we can continue the conversation another couple of times in April. So love it if you could join me. Cool, oh, I didn't realize Daniel Levy has that um, in his book. I have his book right there and clearly I haven't read the whole thing yet. <laughs> Great. He calls it warm calling, but- Warm calling. And I see the comment here um, <laughs> about we only think about what we care about. It does blow your mind and it's going to keep blowing your mind <laughs> for, for a little while. It's fascinating. 
um, ways to engage emotionally besides dad jokes. Well, actually research shows that even things like using emojis in Canvas announcements, um, maybe you choose to send memes with a Canvas announcement, um, anything that kind of warms up the atmosphere of the room can help. And then, um, yeah, engaging emotions. There's lots of lots of things, and it's actually the topic of my new book project. So stay tuned. <laughs> there will be more on that. And again, I'm not necessarily watching the questions. Um, what, what's coming in that we want to address, or what's coming in in Spanish that I'm not fluent in? <laughs> I see Amanda's comment about um, a key takeaway is the neuroscience on the connection of emotions to memory and engagement. Um, yeah, it's it's rich. There's a rich literature on this, but relatively recent. So something for us to kind of wrap our heads around. And it makes sense if you think about it, think of some emotionally meaningful day in your life. Maybe it was your high school graduation. Maybe it was your wedding day. Maybe it was the birth of a child or the loss of a loved one. There are really vivid photo memories of that day. Uh, I believe we're forming those kinds of memories right now in this emotionally heavy season that we're in. So if we can put emotions to work, it's actually gonna help our students to remember what they're learning. And that's, that's a good goal. So, and then I see Michelle's follow-up question on the goals contract again at the end of the semester, do I address that? I, and then after that, I will say, Art, sorry, I just saw your hand. Let me um, answer Michelle's question quickly, and then we'll, um, invite you to unmute if you would like to their art. So I do believe that can be a really effective strategy to circle back to the goals contract even before the end of the semester, maybe at midterm or maybe a third of the way through, come back to students and say, how are you doing with your goals? Does your strategy need, does your action or your strategy need adjusting? That is a way to model and hold students accountable to engage in regulating their own learning. Um, so yeah, I love the idea of coming back to the goals contract at some point, and ideally before the semester is over even. Um, so if they need to, they can modify their approach. And then the goal here too, and research shows this, that students will take some of these approaches and use them in their future classes, even if it's not assigned. So yeah. Okay, Art, would you like to unmute? Hello? I just wanted to ask a question. Um, Please. We have... Oh. We have regular conversations about this, uh, more so than, than I think we should, but there are faculty who are animate about requiring students to be on screen for the whole class. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder, do you have any resources or literature that you can maybe share that where we can, we can be more informed in our conversation? It's a great question. And I Nothing immediately comes to mind. I'm sure it's out there. So let me see if I can send something um, after this conversation. It is a hot topic. We know that it's hard to talk to black boxes. And we know that the cameras help foster the engagement and more engagement leads to better learning. We know all those things. Um, and I empathize, honestly. I, when I say that I don't recommend that we require cameras, I say that very carefully and with sensitivity to our experience, um, staring into the little green light or having no idea about what students are doing on the other side of the screen. But as far as resources or literature, I wanna think a little bit more about that. Thank you. Thank you. What else? And there is your question. Thank you, Art, I see it now. <laughs> Flower, I want to read some of the comments in Spanish. Thank you. Uh, we have one from Angel Joaquin Pérez. Yes. Uh, okay, give me one second. Okay. Uh, that the students enjoy the contents of and to learn it, and that they associate uh, a joke with a theorem. Yes. Uh, we oh. have another one, um, stra strategies to incorporate since planning to interest a student, to bring a student's interest um, without, um, 
without the emotional, like moving the emotional. Thank you. Uh, it's an excellent, the, the, what is it? The, the goals contract is an excellent idea. Thank you. Flower, I wanted to comment on keeping the, uh, the camera on. All of my grandchildren were in the virtual uh, classroom over mm -hmm. the pandemic. And every one of their teachers, when he would start or she would start lecturing, would tell the students, turn your cameras off. And the reason was that especially in elementary school, they do the strangest things while that camera is on. <laughs> and sure. they found that it was really very distracting. So at that level, they said, turn your cameras yes. off. Yeah, yeah, that is interesting. Um, and you know, again, I don't wanna minimize the challenge that this presents. I have a picture of my own daughters. I oftentimes include it on my slide and I may have done this in January, I didn't today, but I have a picture of two of my daughters who are playing a game on the living room floor, like an old fashioned kind of physical game while they're also in Zoom class with their cameras off, right? So I saw this myself and we know it's a challenge and I'm hearing of more and more crazy things students are doing, like trying to Zoom into class while they're at work. Like, what? <laughs> come on, really? So I don't wanna minimize um, these challenges that were unforeseen and that we are now faced with. Um, and I do believe that Again, I, I'm a firm believer in really respecting uh, faculty members' decisions, and there could be a really important reason to have cameras on. I, the class that I'm teaching right now is actually called Technological Fluency in the Workplace. And I argue in the class that video communication is increasingly important and we need to become more fluent and comfortable with it. And I believe we are doing that, but students still struggle. I have them record short videos and many of them don't feel comfortable with that. So I do tell them that they have to show their face unless there's a really good reason not to, you know? And then I ask them, would you please contact me privately and let me know it. There could be a cultural reason. There could be, as some people have been saying in the chat box, uh, reasons, you know, where they just really cannot turn on their camera or use the camera feature for a recording. And I want to know that, but there can be good reasons to ask students to keep their cameras on. We need to, um, clarify those reasons. And again, I think co-creating policies with our students can be really helpful as well. And while driving, yeah, Terrence, I have heard of that. I've heard of students zooming into class while they're boarding an airplane. <laughs> but the one that while they're at work, that's the one that really kind of floored me. Like that, that's just kind of what I mean about training students. Like maybe on day one, you talk about don't zoom into class while you're on the job. I don't know. <laughs> So I'm sure that I may have missed some comments. And again, um, I don't want to, um, if, if there were comments or questions that come in in Spanish, I want to make sure that we're attending to those as well. But now, Susan, I see that you have a hand up also. I was just going to say, I have a colleague who does two, I think very smart things about encouraging camera use. She doesn't require. One mm -hmm. is similar to what you said when students say, I can't, I won't, I don't want to. She says, well, let's talk about an, another way for me to be sure that you are engaged. Let's find another way for us and for you to engage with the class. And the other is the first day of class, she just routinely does a thing on creating virtual backgrounds, okay. which is sometimes the issue. And you know, when it is, yeah. That's an easy thing. She doesn't say why. She just does it as a fun thing. Yes. Yes. And yeah, thank you, Susan. Um, and now I see Art's comment, which is a very valid concern about um, like recording, for example, this session, but in class, it's different. Now you have a record of interactions that normally there would not have been a record of it teaching in person. Um, it's a privacy issue. It's a security issue. Um, and again, maybe you've been in some presentations where the, you know, where it is announced, we're going to be recording. If you prefer to turn off your camera and even change your name, you know, these are new considerations <laughs> that we didn't think about before, but, um, yeah, we do need to be sensitive. Uh, 
What else? Anything else for today or have our brains become full? <laughs> well, if our brains have become full, then it, it, it's, it, we just want to take the last minute here to thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Flower, for, for joining us today and being here and sharing um, the, your wisdom and knowledge. And, and also thanks to all the faculty who, who took the, you know, a large chunk of time out of yeah. their day to come and also be, pre be um, with us. And we look forward uh, to seeing you on April 5th, Flower, and hopefully everyone else who's who's on the, on the Zoom call, we hope to see you again. Uh, the topic will be promoting equity inclusion in the classroom. And then there'll be a, a third session, which will be April 21st. And uh, TB, TBD, yeah, we'll, not, we'll, we'll, we'll tell nice you when topic. that, it looks like we might have uh, scheduled the wrong topic, but now you know our secrets. <laughs> so we're going to re we're going to have a different it'll be a different topic um, from from power and then also also Enrique will be providing some nice music um, elevator music next week next time. <laughs> I don't want I don't, I don't want to forget that Enrique so you've committed and I look forward to that we'll let you in early from the waiting room next week so so here's yeah sorry oh, I was going to yeah. say a quick a quick teaser I have another super practical idea to keep students engaged when they're in zoom and cameras are off but I'm going to leave that oh. cliffhanger oh. I'm going to leave it <laughs> <laughs> well I guess you have to come back everyone so so thank you so much for your time and your attention and have a great day we hope to see you on April 5th thank Laura, you all thank you so that. much and it was great to see everyone today yes thank you all thanks for coming. a lot bye Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Muchas gracias. Thanks, Thanks all. Gracias. Bye. We honestly, in um, for our Mexico faculty, uh, Lolina, uh, for our Mexico faculty, we're, we have a Canvas session starting in fifteen minutes. Okay. So that's a lot. Of, <laughs> that's what, yeah. See you later. See you later. <laughs> <laughs> Qué bueno.